Hello, I'm John Lom Paris. I'm the director of the United Methodist Action Ministry for the Institute on Religion and Democracy. I'm joined today by Timothy Chrysler. I'm going to put a fuller bio in the text below, but he is a professor in the department chair for television production and broadcast technology at Heinz Community College. He is also the former lay leader of the Mississippi Annual Conference of the United Methodist Church. Thanks for joining me today, Tim. Oh, glad to be here with you, John. Thank you. Glad to have you here. So to jump right in, uh, when you first found out about uh, what had happened to George Floyd in Minneapolis, what were you thinking and feeling? Um, John, I guess um, I was like many African Americans uh, when we saw that played out in social media, uh, live, real time. It's devastating, heartbroken. Um, it's something that you don't want to witness, something that we've seen so many times uh, in movies, um, things that we've heard about since I've been a child. My parents talked about it, uh, but to actually witness it, you know, it, it, it's something that gives Pretty much everyone, I'm sure I, I, I say this, when I say this, I'm probably speaking for every uh, African-American male and female in America. Uh, nightmares, because it's something that you really do not want to see or witness. Today, there are a lot of white Americans uh, who uh, will, without any malicious intent, will say, uh, at least to each other, or uh, sincerely believe things like, look, I know the basics of U.S. history. I know about slavery and about Jim Crow, and that was wrong. That was that was evil and horrible. It was very good that we moved past that, but uh, we, slavery was uh, 19th century uh, Jim Crow. We had the civil rights laws at various stages in the in ways in the 50s and 60s before either you or I were born. So uh, sure, people are still sinful. There are still jerks in the world. And some of those jerks might be racist jerks uh, in terms of individual incidents and individual people. But in terms of uh, why there, there's no longer a problem anymore, we took care of that problem in terms of there being widespread uh, racism by whites against others in this country. I'm, I'm not expressing that myself, but that is a widespread perspective out there. Um, how would you uh, respond to that mindset? Uh, I think the easiest response to that is that there's an, an unawareness that even though in the 21st century, we seem like we've had, we've come a long way from the 1960s before we were born, John, uh, but we still have a long ways to go. Uh, the, the killing of George Floyd, uh, shows that. Um, yes, a lot of people feel that's done with. That's ancient history. But I'm here to tell you that is not done with. It is not ancient history. The problem is that everyone has went to sleep on this very uh, detrimental problem, which is racism. And it has plagued our community, African-American community, uh, for over hundreds of years. And it's still here. Uh, you know, we're dealing with the coronavirus right now, but this epidemic of racism has been here uh, for a while. And it has become acceptable. Uh, it has taken on many different forms. Uh, and a lot of people, because it's so ugly, and um, we, we choose to turn a, a, a blind eye to it, a blind ear to it, and say, no, not here in my neighborhood. No, not here in my state. No, not in my community. No, not in my church. Uh, you know, not in my household, but truth be told, it is very much alive and well. Uh, it's something I mean, that has not been uh, Denialism, like like denying that that might be a problem other elsewhere, but certainly not among my people or my community. Exactly. Uh, you know, with me growing up here in Mississippi, it has been a stigma that we've had here in this state for a long time because of our very ugly and public history. You know, and most of the southern states have uh, uh, been through this uh, uh, quite, you know, it's something that is shameful. And many of my white brethren and sisters don't like to talk about it. You know, me being an educator in, in, uh, in college, uh, I address it quite often with my 
uh, students in the classroom. Um, and I found that it is very uncomfortable, and which it should be, very uncomfortable uh, because of the nature of it. But at the same time, it's something that's got to be spoken about, something that we uh, I have to uh, speak out about and against. And I think uh, a lot of us have been hesitant uh, to do so, I think, um, because it makes people uncomfortable. Uh, I, I know when you, you called me and asked me about doing this interview, you know, you said yourself, I don't know if I'm the, the best person to speak on this subject. And, and, I, and I assured you, yes, you are. Everybody's voice is needed on this subject, white, black, red or blue. We all need to be speaking out and trying to be a drum major for injustice when it comes to racism. Thank you. Uh, do you, are there any particular experiences of either yourself or uh, in your family uh, of things happening after the 1970s that uh, people, maybe some white listeners who are watching this, uh, who feel identify with the perspective I shared earlier, uh, would might be surprised, wow, that actually happened uh, that late in history or that recently? Uh, uh, yes, um, I've experienced it. Um, my wife has experienced it. My daughter has experienced it. Um, my parents, of course, because they grew up during that era. I don't think anybody, um, it, it, whether you recognize it or not, you, you may have experienced some form of racism or not. And, you know, racism is not just blind to uh, a particular color. It's more picked on with African Americans than in any other population. But I mean, Hispanic, Latinos, um, e even some white people have been uh, plagued by racism, you know, just because they are black friends or they marry outside their race and choose to, uh, to, to marry a, 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 a black person or a white, you know, a, a person outside of their um, ethnicity. Um, and, and, and like I said, it's painful. It's sad. You know, and I look at uh, my daughter, I look at my nieces and my nephews and they're friends they're of different color and, 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 and they're cool. You know, it's to the point where they're oblivious to what's going on. But at some point, someone has to teach that racism. And, and that's what happens in society. As children grow up, they're innocent to this. Mm -hmm. But it, it's a teaching that we have got to stop. And more conversations like this would help bring about change. But, you know, uh, I, I can look back at it now. And as I shared with you over the phone before we did this interview, I, I have a lot of white friends. Uh, I have a lot of white pastors. And me being the former conference lay leader in the United Methodist Church in general, you know, and I've served on a lot of boards and agency. I've had very few of my white friends to reach out to me individually. Now, they may have reached out to other African-Americans, and I hope they have, to say, you know, how are you doing, you know, uh, during this? How has this impacted you and your family? Uh, because like I said, we, we sit down and we have conversations. And I mean, it was a big topic in our church. It, it was a big topic with my students. Even though college was out for the summer, a lot of my students reached out to me because we're in media. Mr. Christmas, what do you think about this? How could we have covered this? You know, it, it, it is just a, you know, like I said, George Floyd, as tragically as he died, and as publicly as he did die, his death will not be in vain. Um, he has opened so many people's eyes to this um, critical situation of racism. And, I, I, and, and for that, we as African Americans owe him a, a great deal of gratitude because we've been living with this for, for forever. You know, all my lifetime, I've seen it. I've seen it. Um, at jobs that I no longer have. I haven't experienced it at Heinz, thank God. Uh, but I have seen it on other jobs that I've been uh, a part of, uh, where someone who uh, does not look like me, does not have the education that I have, come in and get higher paid rate or, or, or wage than I do, even become my boss. And I have to train that person. And that's just privilege because of the color of their skin. Um, I've went to restaurants with my wife and, 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 and been discriminated against where I know I called and had reservations, but yet someone who did not look like me go through the door and may not even have a reservation. 
Mm. And that has happened, you know, not here in just Mississippi, that has happened in other places, you know, and, um, and my wife is quick to tell me, well, just look over that, you know, because she, you know, I smoothed it over, but I see it. Uh, I'm more so probably because as African American male, I think we're discriminated a little bit harder. And I, I, I say that cautiously because I know my African American sisters, they catch it too. You know, whether it's on the workforce, whether it's in, uh, uh, you know, in, in their communities, whether it's, uh, you know, in, in other social places that we may be interacting to. It, it is most definitely alive and well. Um, and you see it, blatant and plain sometimes. And a lot of it, I think, is because people don't know Jesus anymore. They don't know Jesus Christ. They haven't found him because once you know him, and I have to say this, then you can love your enemies in spite of whether they hate you or not because of the color of your skin. And I think that's where a lot of people miss the boat. We've lost that courtesy. We've lost that uh, genuine love for one another as human beings. And that, that, that what brings about this racism and, and bigotry. And we don't even know we're discriminating against people sometimes. I think ignorance plays a big key into that part. Hmm. Uh, thanks for sharing. I, I wanted to pick up on, uh, particularly when you're talking about, you know, uh, kids, I mean, we're both, we're both parents trying to raise our kids to, uh, you know, be prepared for what's often a mean world with people that don't know Jesus. Uh, the media uh, recently, there's been lots of mentions of the talk that African American parents uh, have with their children. And for uh, viewers and listeners that are not familiar with, well, what is this talk that gets Reference, but not often, not always defined in the media. Could you tell us about what is the talk? Right, John. The talk. That's something that is happening probably more so often in every African American home uh, at even an earlier age. Now, my my daughter is thirteen years old, and I I know for a fact we've had the talk, as you say. Um, probably ever since she was, I, I would say nine, I've brought it up to her. Uh, because I know the day is coming where she's gonna be somewhere where I'm not gonna be, or her mother's not gonna be. And I want her to know what to do and to be safe and, and, and how to react to certain situations and be aware. Uh, this is a conversation that uh, most white families will never have to talk, where you sit and say, you know, if you're approached by a police officer, Make sure you have both hands on the steering wheel. Make sure you drive to a safe, well-lit uh, 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 well lit area before you get out, you know, where there's some people there. Uh, and it's sad, you know, and not all policemen, let me say this and be clear about it, not all policemen are bad police. Some are there to protect and to serve. But what we saw uh, played out in social media with George Floyd, that happens way too often, way too often. And, and sometimes it's not even a policeman. It could be someone else. Uh, I, I can't count on any hands of mine or, or my family's hands, how many uh, African-Americans have died unjustly uh, just because of the color of their skins. So yeah, we have the talk and the talk is simple. You know, what to do if you're approached by an officer, what, what, what not to do, you know. Um, uh, I never will forget growing up, my dad would tell me about careful who ride in my car with me if they were not the same color, especially if it was a, 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 a white female and, and, and you're in the car with three black boys, be careful, son, because even though things have changed, they haven't changed a whole lot. And I would be just like my nephews are today. Oh, you living in the past. My nephews would tell me that quick. Uncle Tim, you living in the past. But if you don't teach, you may repeat your past. And it won't be very good for us, as we saw it was not very good for Brother uh, Mr. Floyd. Um, I, I, th so the talk ranges from a lot of perspectives. It depends if you have a young African-American son, if you have a young African-American daughter, there are certain things, you know, most parents will sit and say, just drive careful, Junior. Put your seatbelt on. We have to go that extra mile mm -hmm. as to, you know, make sure you don't drink and drive. Of course, we all have that talk, but if you, find yourself in a situation, make sure you turn your cell phone on, you know, 
cut that phone on so daddy can hear the conversation if you get pulled over by the policeman. Uh, maybe even turn the camera on, take that extra precaution, you know, but it's getting- layer protection needed from, from somebody who's supposedly there to protect us. Exactly, every layer. Uh, if you talk about a scenario of some high school friends, uh, there's a black guy and a white guy driving together in the car, and let's say the African-American is the one who's driving, or even a black guy and a white woman uh, who might be a friend or a girlfriend or, you know, driving somebody to work or any kind of reasons people drive together and they say, oh, be careful about who you're driving with. Uh, what are specifically, what, what are specifically some of the, um, the fears of how that could go bad or some actual, you know, ways that, you know, people have heard about how such scenarios can suddenly just innocent thing, friends driving together suddenly uh, take a very dramatic turn for the worse. Well, and, and I don't think it's as bad as that today. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to paint that picture that, you know, a, a black man can't ride with a white lady in the car as friends in broad daylight. Or if, um, when my dad told me that, you had to think that was late 80s, early 90s. Mm -hmm. um, in a little small town where that wasn't um, socially acceptable yet. Mm. Um, things have changed now where I don't think it's to the point where uh, my daughter couldn't go out with her white friends safely. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, um, in some states, and I think, and I want to say this, I think Mississippi probably is in a better shape right now than most of the country, basically because we've lived that. Hmm. We've lived that, and and we've managed that. Don't don't get me wrong. I'm not saying Mississippi does not have racial issues because we do, and we have uh, um, Christian um, organizations that have took a stand for it, uh, uh, like Mission Mississippi here, and uh, that, that that works on problems with race relations here in Mississippi. Uh, but still, it's just like, for example, I guess since we're dealing with Christian people as well. It, the 11 o'clock hour or whatever time your church service is on Sunday. It is still across this country, one of the most segregated hours of the week. Mm -hmm. um, so when I say that, it shouldn't be. I, I have a Nigerian friend, uh, uh, James uh, Ashinda. I call his name, I'm sure he won't mind. But when he first came into this country and we started working together, he told me, he said, what, what, what is this black church, white church? What is this go out to a, 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 a white party or, or a, a black party or a black club and white club? Where I came from, it was just one. We were all together, just a party. We went to church, it was all church. So he could not understand this, especially the, the, the divide in the races. You know, they never look at color or refer to each other by color. Just Nigerian. You know, and I've heard that from a lot of my brothers and sisters who are, you know, in other countries. Um, and so I, I, I'm careful to, I don't want to paint the picture that a, 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 a white guy, me and you, John, can't get in the car and ride together because I don't think we're that bad right now. And uh, we're, once upon a time, it probably would have been pretty bad. Mm -hmm. uh, but secretly, someone may, if they have that racist tendency, then they see me and you hanging out and you coming over to my house eating and I'm going over to your house eating. Well, then you may be ostracized later on and not even know it. Um, you know, same thing with uh, African-Americans. Sometimes by the company that we keep or we have too many white friends, you can be ostracized by uh, whites. Oh, okay, he think he's getting up in society a little too much. We need to clip his wings. Uh, it can't let him move up on this job force because, you know, he's getting a little too comfortable. So there are ways to, uh, you know, as I say all the time, we're not lynching people anymore. Well, I say that, and it just happened this week, from what I hear, <laughs> in another state uh, where two African Americans were found hung. So uh, I, I guess I have to be careful and retract that we're not doing that because we are. But it's we're lynching in another way as well. Mm. Is what I'm trying to get at. And sometimes it's by uh, police brutality. I mean, George. Floyd, eight minutes and 46 seconds 
Mm -hmm. That's a public lynching on social media that was played out. And thank God for social media. Yeah. Because had it not been for that platform, the world would have never known. Mm -hmm. And the attention that is being brought today, me and you would not be having this conversation right now. But the problem would still be existing. I mean, I can, I can, I can share with you, I mean, when I was um, working in media, and I would work late hours uh, sometime, uh, do the 10 p.m. newscast. And so driving from Jackson, Mississippi to my hometown of Crystal Springs, I would make it maybe to Crystal Springs by 11, 11, 15. And I can remember going through a roadblock and being pulled over and asked my license. But then the officer took it a little bit further. He put his hand inside the car and picked up what was, to me, grass from the yard on this, and questioned it, what is this? And I looked at it and I told him, I say, it looked like grass to me, but he was thinking it was something else, illegal drugs or something. But just because of the color of my skin and the kind of car I was riding in, and it was after 11 o'clock at night, I got a little extra question. And I often wonder, had my skin color been different, had I not been in that type of car that I was in, would I have been targeted or even questioned to that? Or wanted to search? He wanted to go as far as to search me that night, you know, the whole car. And I had to tell him, do you have a search warrant? And then finally he bagged off. You're just driving home from work. You're driving home from work. Regular routine traffic stop where they're stopping all the cars. But yet, this is what's happening to everyone that looks like me, I'm sure. Now, I wasn't in their cars, but I'm sure if it happened it to me. It wasn't happening to every car, but it was a few people were being picked out. Targeted, exactly. Mm. Exactly. Mm. So, you know, like I said, most African Americans probably have a story similar to that or have experienced something to that, whether it was traffic related, police related, whether it was uh, a job related, it happens mm -hmm. way more often than what we would like to experience. That's, we do, I do appreciate you sharing, Tim, and I think perhaps an unfairly broad question, but, uh, and I know that we need to be careful about generalizing about any large group of people, but what are some things, Tim, that you would like to see from I'd uh, like to see more of uh, as it regards to um, to matters of uh, racism and not just not just racism, specifically white supremacy and uh, racial injustice uh, that you would like to see more of in terms of responses from uh, white conservative evangelicals like me or maybe even including me. I think you've taken the first step, John, by addressing the problem. And we need to see more of that, you know, uh, not just us having had to speak up on our cause of injustice of racism, but more of my white brothers are, are as you said, uh, conservative members of our church, speaking up, making this a huge platform. Don't let it just die back down. Don't let George Floyd's death be in vain. Uh, you know, he's just one of many. Don't let their deaths be in vain. You know, let's not go back to letting this problem become a sleeping giant again. Uh, we can't be silent on this anymore. Uh, no more is what, uh, you know, we need to be saying as a church, as conservatives, uh, as white, black, Americans, Hispanic, Latino, everybody needs to be marching and saying, you know, black lives matter. Uh, this injustice, this racism, it, it, we should just be, uh, you know, it should just make all of us uncomfortable. Uh, but we should be comfortable enough that we can speak upon this issue. And so, you know, I would love to see our conservative brothers and sisters of, of, of the church and of any uh, organization take a stand and help fight this, uh, this, this, this terrible, terrible uh, injustice of racism because it has went on way too long. I mean, for us to be in the 21st century, and, and we still feel like we're back in the, in, in, in the 60s, uh, experiencing things that you thought we have overcome from, and we still got a long ways to go. It, it is tragic. Uh, and you know, there are way more happier subjects that we could be talking about tonight than this. Uh, but this is a major problem in America, and we got to uh, address it. I mean, and it, it, it is something that should have been addressed way too long. And, I, I, you know, I call upon our leaders of the church. I call on uh, 
our, our leaders of this country and, and, you know, and of every state to take a stand. Whatever position you, you, you have, we have a responsibility to make sure that this is made right. Thank you. And I think I keep coming back to uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 26, when one part of the body of Christ suffers, we all suffer that, you know, we're different individuals. We have different backgrounds and other ways that people treat us. But as long as you and my brother in, in Christ are being treated in ways, even that I have the privilege of not being treated, I have no right as your brother in Christ to not care. Uh, to, I have no right as your brother, uh, double negative, no right to not care. I have an obligation to keep caring and to be involved in having it be a commitment that goes beyond just making a couple YouTube videos and saying, okay, that was nice for the moment. And then moving on after to something else. Uh, but this, as you say, uh, as I heard you saying, needs to be sustained yeah. as, as long as, as long as it's an issue for you, I have no right to not let it be an issue for me. Right. And I think that's what a lot of uh, my white brothers and sisters don't understand is that, you know, even though they may not see the problem, walk a minute in my shoes, mm. you know, and, and you'll see it. Um, and it's sad and it's ugly, but um, we got to continue to turn the light on this dark situation. Well, thank you for taking some time today to help shine the light for those viewing and, and listening. And uh, Tim, could I just ask you to just uh, close us in prayer for our nation? Yes, yes, John. And thank you for having me. Um, I, I hope I I did that. I hope I shared a little insight um, and, and said something that may be helpful. And thank you for having me again. You did. Thank you. Thank you. Let us pray. Dear merciful Almighty God, we pause at this time to give thanks unto you. We thank you, dear Lord, for the life of George Floyd. We thank you, dear Lord, for this opportunity. We thank you for John for taking a stand to, to help others hear and start the conversation. Dear Lord, we ask that even though this Zoom session is stopping right now, this recording is getting ready to end, we ask and pray that our nation keeps this conversation going way for many, many, many years so that our children, children, children will know that this is evil, racism, and that this is something that should never be tolerated, should never be acceptable, mm -hmm. and that we as people, Christian people, have to stand for you, Christ, and show that love that you would have us to show so that others will see your light in us and racism will be destroyed. Dear Lord, we ask that you strengthen all of our leaders to give them the courage to fight this good fight, dear Lord. We ask a special blessing on all of the victims that have been victimized, terrorized, humiliated by racism. We ask that you give them peace, dear Lord. We ask that you calm their families, dear Lord, for the families who have lost loved ones to this evil. We pray a special blessing for them to give them the strength to continue to walk with their heads up, knowing that their loved one didn't do anything wrong, dear Lord. And, 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 and in spite of however their loved one may have passed on at the hands of injustice and at the hands of racism, that they learn to forgive, dear Lord, and practice love. And we just pray right now, special blessing upon our, these United States, dear Lord. Help us, dear Lord. Help us to see our wrong and, and admit our wrong and want to do right. And we pray all of these things in your darling son, Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. Thank you too, John. God bless you, man.